Hey folks, Doug Blake with Body Design University. Welcome to another weekly study. And today, um, in lieu of doing a uh, PowerPoint presentation along with talking to you about this, I wanted to, I wanted to go over um, a couple of things simultaneously because we get a ton of questions and they're related to obviously multiple, multiple issues with studying. Uh, but the one big one that always comes up is number one, how do I memorize the material? How do I study to ensure that I can actually pass the exam? So that's, that's the first thing, right? And then there's always specific areas within the textbook where students tend to have a lot of, uh, a lot of questions on uh, explanation of specific concepts um, and the content itself. So there's always questions related to how do I study and memorize it? And here's some specific content that I'm struggling with. How do I actually understand it? And so those are two, those are two sides uh, to basically the same coin. So I kind of want to help you, help you to get this. And in order to do that, we've been seeing any number of questions, particularly in chapter nine, muscular training foundations and benefits. Now I do have my textbook with me. Uh, and again, here it is. How do I study? How do I learn the material? You know, I say it over and over every time you watch any of the educational videos that we do at Body Design University is probably going to involve right here. It's a pad. Okay. Read, write, recite. Read it, write it, and then say it over and over why? Because at the end of the day, you've got to understand that your learning style and the multiple ways that people learn have to be incorporated into your study sessions. And so that's the idea. Now, keep in mind, if I'm going over material and I'm a, a sort of an auditory focused learner, okay, what I say to you right now, as far as reading and writing it down, that's going to be a little bit of a struggle for you. It doesn't mean you don't do it. No, everybody should do it. We're humans. We all learn through multiple, uh, multiple modalities. It's just that from a, learning, from a learning perspective, some folks, more than others, tend to connect to the information uh, and navigate the information better from a memorization standpoint by listening a little bit more. Some folks are much more physical. So the writing is very helpful. And in fact, using, I think I've got um, pencils and markers, uh, drawing pictures. So anything that you see that's going to help you engage more effectively, more efficiently, is what we're trying to do and to try to help you with. So there's just some techniques that you, you're going to need to use no matter where you're at in this textbook. Okay, just keep that in mind. It's always, first and foremost, memorization at the heart of learning, the beginning of learning anything. Can't think of anything where it's not going to be this way. You've got to engage material and then memorize it. You've got to be able to draw it back out of your short, midterm, even long-term memory so that it can be applied to whatever it is you're using the material for. Now, again, in this particular context, you want to be able to draw information <clears throat> out of your short, generally midterm memory um, to pass the exam. That requires that you memorize material. You've got to know basic concepts. Um, everything in this book, if you think about it, needs to be, quote, memorized in some way, shape, or form. You've got to be able to pull out that information to effectively answer questions on the exam. So that's the first step. The reason we do practice exams is to learn and understand how questions are being asked. Just knowing that a synergist is this or that an agonist or antagonist definitionally is this may not be enough to navigate the questions, right? Because the questions are generally, and ACE does this, um, and it's, it's a good thing they do it because it's a better way of understanding if you know the material, they're going to ask you um, generally circumstantial type questions. A client is doing this and this happens. What is the best way to do A, B, C, or D, right? So that's going to be the vast majority of the questions they ask. And so you have to study, memorize, learn it, and then do practice exams, quizzes, questions over 
and over. So you get the idea of how they are asking those questions, and then you can access the memorized information. Please keep in mind also um, the key to establishing uh, memorized material into short and into then mid and long term memory generally involves repetition. Okay, that's just the nature, nature of the beast, the way our brains work, the more we're exposed to the information over and over and over, uh, the better chance you have of actually memorizing that material. Okay, so we've done, we've done uh, videos on studying. And if you have more questions about that, you can access those videos inside our inside our channel. And of course, leave comments or other questions. But look, this is it. You got to have a pad. You've got to write. You've got to write. And I know some of you are saying, well, I use a highlighter. Okay. Reading. Okay. Unless you are one of the 0.01% of the human population, reading is not studying. Okay. Listen again. Unless you are, I mean, these folks are very few. They're out there, of course, okay, where you can actually read it and memorize it, okay? But those people are few, far few, and in between, uh, more than likely, you're not one of those individuals. And therefore, reading something, as I'm sitting in this book and I'm reading, I can read the material. That's not studying, folks. Even if I read it a second time, that is not technically studying. That is the beginning, or it is a part of studying. Uh, what you have to do at that point is you have to now engage the material, the information in a different way that's going to uh, create a more engaging element for your brain to memorize the material. Again, there's techniques to do this. Uh, the first one for sure is if it's academic information, like we're talking about here, or you have uh, charts and tables, it's going to be writing and rewriting it and then rewriting it and rewriting it over and over and over. Again, the more you do it, the more established into your memory bank it's going to get. So by the way, everything I've just spoke to you, this introduction up till now helps you with the entire textbook. In fact, it helps you with anything, even outside of the personal training scenario and trying to take a test. That type of learning, that type of engagement with materials will help you on your, your SAT or any of your other standardized tests. As long as you understand how the questions are being asked and you can memorize the material, then technically you should do, you should do well on those type of exams. So that's the one side of this is you gotta pass. Remember, that's what we wanna help you to do is to pass the ACE exam on the first go around or at whatever point you are, if you failed it once or twice. The other thing is, is that for sure, and I don't think I've ever met anyone studying for these examinations that doesn't want to actually be a personal trainer in the real world, and therefore understanding and getting this information into your gray matter is going to help you when you actually get out there and start training people. And, and you know as well as I do, you want to do some of this stuff for yourself, for your own personal training, right? You want to look at this and go, oh man, I can... I can understand muscular actions, and now I can apply it to my personal exercise routine regimen. Sure, that's fine as well. So with that said, that's why I'm kind of got the book open, and we are in chapter nine, muscular training foundations and benefits. And one of the, one of the kind of recurring questions that we get is, how do I understand the terminology? So names of muscles joint actions, right? Planar motion, kinesiological terms. Well, um, like anything else, look, if you're, you're watching, you're watching this video right now, do yourself a big favor, put it on pause, grab your textbook and grab a pad. Look, I've been doing this. I've been doing this a long time. And when I, when I'm trying to learn anything new material, look, look what I got. I write stuff down, constantly writing stuff down, constantly over and over, I'm trying to learn a language right now. So you see, over and over and over, I'm writing stuff down constantly. 
It's the consistency, that daily activity of 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour of studying this material, it's going to help you to memorize it. But of course, you've got to then do practice exams. You've got to uh, ask questions related to the material that's going to help you to ultimately access the information you've memorized into answering the question. So in chapter nine, we're always, you know, and that's why I'm here in human motion terminology. Here is the recommendations. My recommendation when it comes to dealing with materials like this, and, and I've said this before, ACE, in my opinion, did a great job of moving from their fifth to the sixth edition. The information is a little bit uh, more sort of academically accessible. There's still a lot of information, but I believe they did a pretty good job. There may be a couple of, you know, issues here and there with, um, with uh, terms and, and uh, the way they're explained. Uh, a lot of this information, by the way, can be difficult to kind of grasp if that's not the way you're thinking, or if you don't have experience in uh, the fitness world, resistance training in any way, shape or form. Yeah, of course, it can be a little bit challenging. That's why we see even in our Facebook group, you'll notice that there are um, individuals that will make a post just as a for instance, and go, I'm a nurse, or I've been in healthcare for 30 years. And I feel like I'm, well, that's because this is not healthcare information. Some of it's very simple for as somebody that's been in healthcare, anatomy, some of the physiology, but no, in, in ACEs material, there's a lot more uh, related to uh, the specificity of fitness and wellness, which is just not something normally taught that I know in any nursing program, just as a, for instance, nothing against that, but here's going to be the recommendation. First and foremost, get a pad, pencil, have a and you would do this, by the way, after you watch this, uh, watch the video, grab some colored markers, be prepared, get some, you know, I've got my printer back here so I can grab blank printer paper and I can use that to draw. But, but trust me, you'll still want to have a systematic way that you're moving through the material because that's the way it was written. Okay, so it was written systematically, right? As we go from page, and by the way, page 352, what I'm going to talk to you about, because this is what human motion terminology, this is where the majority of this material is, goes all the way to page 350, 359. After that, we move into a new topic. You'll notice that if you're looking at the textbook, or even when you, if you have the, the textbook online, it's in red larger font red, human motion terminology, the next large font in red heading title is benefits of muscular training. So the way you normally attack this from a, from a studying perspective is go ahead and write down, this is what I do. I'm in human motion terminology. We're not going to get into benefits of muscular training. That's another topic that you would spend time on. So I would literally write human motion terminology, and that's what I'm going to have. I, I didn't write it out just so you know, it's kind of scribbly, but that's what I would have written human motion terminology. And I would basically use either this pad specifically for this topic or just a couple of pages. And I'm going to use, I mean, I'm going to write all over this front and back to get the physicality of writing. I'm also going to, it's a pencil, but if I had a marker, I would use markers and I would draw, I would, uh, do pictures, I would do anything, even multiple, multiple font types to engage my brain in a more creative fashion that might help me memorize the material. So human motion terminology, page 352, it tells you that there are several terms that you need to know. There's also terms for muscle functions. Here is where you utilize the book and what the, uh, what the editors, writers, Put in here, they bolded some of these major terms for you. So I would simply write synergists, right? And what is a synergist? Well, they give you the definition. They assist the agonist. Well, I don't even know what an agonist is. Well, what's an agonist? Well, write that down. Agonist is the actual muscle that is producing the expected movement. So the agonist is the is that muscle that you're working when you do dumbbell curls. So when I do dumbbell curls. And I'm, and I'm flexing my elbow, 
what muscle is under tension that's providing the motion, the concentric and eccentric contractions. It's going to be the bicep. That is my agonist. The muscle then, the muscle that opposes, if it was working, that opposes the agonist muscle is termed the antagonistic muscle, the antagonist, right? So there's some terminology. And so what you would do is you would write that down. Now, you could also go ahead and draw a picture, okay? And I can draw, and the more I'm engaging creatively with the material, the better chance I'm actually going to memorize it. So I put synergist, which is assists the agonist in causing a desired action. Um, classic example at the elbow, heck, we'll use the bicep, right? Let's just, let's just talk about the bicep, for instance. So if the bicep, when I'm doing a dumbbell curl, is the agonist, that's the muscle that is actually causing the movement, the desired movement, are there any synergistic muscles? Are there any synergists? Are there muscles that are assisting the bicep, the agonist, in causing the desired action? Well, absolutely, at the elbow. You may not know this, but you got three flexor, three flexor muscles at the elbow, the biceps brachii, which is the bicep, right? That's the guy that gets, you know, looks round, right? And that's what we call the biceps, right? But there are two other assisting muscles that go along with the bicep anytime you do a dumbbell curl, and it's the brachialis and the brachioradialis. So those are, those are uh, synergistic muscles. And so you got to kind of keep that in mind that anytime you look at an exercise or a movement, uh, look at the muscle that you're working, right? If you're, if you're doing overhead dumbbell presses, right? What muscle groups are you working? Well, I know there's muscles that I'm working. There are a bunch of them, but what, but why do I go into the gym? Why do I go into the facility to actually uh, train? What muscle am I focusing on when I do a uh, multi-joint movement like a dumbbell press? Well, it's my deltoids. Yes, I know my triceps are being worked, but, but that's not what I'm training. Okay. It's, it's shoulder day, right? It's chest, shoulders, and tricep day, right? So I'm aiming and focusing on my deltoids, but even though my triceps are working, I'm focused on this guy. So I'm, I'm basically saying that my deltoids are the agonist muscle, right? What are the synergistic muscles that go along with this movement? Well, obviously there's a, there's a bunch of them. Synergists can actually uh, be uh, muscles that assist by actively contracting themselves, or they can be stabilizers, well, what stabilizes my shoulder girdle when I'm doing a pushing movement, right? My trapezius, you know, the, the sits muscles, right? Super, super spinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, all of those muscles, right? And you start to, you start to say, oh my goodness, there's so many names of, well, sure, just write them down, and memorize them, write them down over and over. So, so they act as joint stabilizers, neutralize rotation, yada, yada. You write down synergist and you write that down and then draw some pictures. It might help you to, and then look at your knee joint and you ask that same question at the knee. What muscle am I working? Is it the quads? Well, if I'm doing squats, the general understanding is that my focus is on the quad, even though I get my glutes and yes, your hamstrings work. Yes, your gastroc and your calves work. Yes, basically every muscle works when you do a squat, but that's not why I went into the gym to train. Okay, I went into the gym to train my quads. So when I did squats, my agonist, the agonist, the muscle that I am focused on creating this movement, technically is the quadriceps, the four muscles of the quads. Yes, I know I have hip extension. Yes, I know I have all these other ancillary movements going on, but because I am focused on that particular muscle, that's the agonist, right? So, and then the opposing muscle to the quadriceps is going to be the hamstrings, but you get the idea, synergist. So I'm writing this down. Now I get to my first subheading, which is types of muscular action. Write that down. Remember, you create, it's just easier if you create a, um, a systematic pattern of getting the information onto the paper and then engaging it and doing the creative things that might be helpful. So I'm going to write types, types of muscular action. And then underneath that, I'm going to, you know, put a little dash and I'm going to say static or isometric action. And I'm going to read through that. 
what is static action, right? What are the types of muscular actions? There's static, concentric, and eccentric. You know this. There's the uh, point where the muscle doesn't change length. We call that an isometric contraction. The muscle shortens under tension. It's called a concentric. We call it the positive. If you're in the gym, okay, if you're in the gym, you're not saying concentric to your clients. You're not saying concentric to your workout buddy. You're not saying, hey, let's do eccentric. No, no, no. We don't, we don't use that terminology. That is the technical terminology, but we call it the colloquial usages, positives, and negatives. So understand that, but also understand that if ACE is asking you a question on a test, they want you to know that it's concentric, eccentric, or isometric. You write that down. Draw the pictures. Do it just sitting there and doing it, kind of doing it yourself and asking you some of these Ask yourself some of these questions. Well, the deltoid shortens and lengthens, so that's got to be, right? So that's what I'm doing. Concentric, shortening action, eccentric, and I'm writing that down. You read through it, okay? Make sure you understand the material. If you don't understand the material, then you've got to go back, re-engage it, and then here's one of the, probably one of the most important things you can do is put a little X mark next to it. I do that all the time when I'm reading these. I've, I've have, I have found... Um, problems, right? Incorrect grammar, incorrect syntax. I found these in, in their textbook. You make a mark, make a note, make sure that you engage it, then go into like the Facebook group or, or, um, or engage with uh, some other entity that will give you the answers, right? You can ask us and we'll, we'll get back with you on it, right? So, so I hope you hope that makes sense. You, you then continue to move through the next subheading underneath underneath uh, types of muscular action boom, 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 is going to be kinetic chain movement. Okay, so kinetic chain movement um, has some has some terminology: open kinetic chain exercises or closed kinetic chain exercises. The general understanding um, is that open chain movements um, have the distal component of the kinetic chain. Kinetic chain is simply the joints and body segments involved in a particular movement. Uh, you can get, you can go way off on a rabbit trail on that. Open kinetic chain movements generally mean that the distal or the distant part of the kinetic chain away from the midline of the body is moving and the proximal, the proximal portion is not. Closed kinetic chain movements are where like in a push-up, my hands are flat, but my torso is moving. So if my torso is moving, but my hands aren't, distal is stationary, proximal is moving. We call that a closed kinetic chain movement. And you can, of course, read that. It's really just easier to remember basic exercises. Um, in athletic training and in more research-based research type of information, we go a little bit more in depth as to the concept of, of kinetic chain or kinematic chains, which is another other term that is used, but the kinetic chain uh, movement patterns are either open or closed. You would read through that and then ask yourself a question. What is a kinetic chain movement? Okay, well, there's push-ups, squats, right? Because the feet are stationary. And the way I normally explain this is that closed kinetic chain movements in general have the hands or the feet, because they're generally the distal component of the kinetic chain anyway, right? From a dumbbell curl to a lateral raise, to a bench press, to a dumbbell press, you name the exercise. It's the hand that's holding the weight, right? And that's what's going to be moving in time and space. But my body, my torso is stabilized, proximal stationary, distal moves, open. Okay, you can, however you want to remember that. If I'm doing a squat or I'm doing a push-up, you'll notice that push-ups and bench press have the same type of movements, right? You have horizontal abduction and adduction. You have elbow flexion and extension, right? Whether you do a bench press, right? Or a push-up. What's the difference? Well, the only difference is that in a bench press, any, anything like that pressing, my hands are moving. Or my torso is stationary. But in a push-up, what is it? Well, my body is moving up and down. So you see the difference. One is open, right, where the hands are moving, and one is closed, where the body is moving. Same thing with a squat versus a leg extension. Leg extensions, open chain movements, squats, squats, hack squats, closed. Leg press, feet are moving. Body is stationary, leg press, feet are moving, open chain movement. So 
Um, the idea is that in order to memorize that, write it, write it down, draw a picture, go on to the, go on to Google and find a picture of it and put it and put it up on your wall. I don't know. Um, but you can see that also what ACE has done is they've given you in figure 922, 923 and 924, just basic uh, exercise concepts and uh, also 925, 926. So as you, as, you move through, as you move through this part of the chapter, uh, page 357, mobility and stability. So that's going to be your last um, subheading. Okay, so I'm gonna write it down, mobility and stability. Movement involves integrated action. And now in figure 928, mobility and stability. Now, now you have an option, okay? When you look, on this particular figure, 928, what do you notice? It's a skeleton with a whole bunch of joint names and, and their basic function. They're either mobility related joints. And I would, I'm just gonna tell you, this is a really good part right here to write down and memorize. Now you have a choice. It's either mobility or stability. From a memorization perspective, after you do it a couple of times, you'll have it memorized. Okay, what I would do is I would draw, I would draw a skeleton and I would go glenohumeral joint. Okay, that's going to be the shoulder, right? So the glenohumeral, glenoid, humerus, glenohumeral. Okay, so that's the shoulder joint. You're going to write mobility, uh, scapulothoracic stability, you get the idea, okay? So basically all you're doing is writing that down, draw a picture of it, and then what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do when you're done? Once you use that side of that piece of paper, tear it off and do it again and rewrite it. And I guarantee you, you will memorize that, that information in particular. And so now of course we get to balance and alignment. Hope you get the idea as I'm going through this with you. You have to be sort of systematic in how you're, how you're creating this outline. And um, it can be a little bit challenging if you're, not, if you're uh, not able to sit there and write this stuff out. I get it. Use a squeezy ball, do something. If, you're, if you are so kind of antsy when it comes to studying, I get that too. Um, the idea then is to use something to sort of disengage the physicality issues that you have, right? If you are a more of like a kinetic type person where you're tapping your feet like I am, you know, you might have to grab something while you're writing and squeeze it. And that's going to kind of pull your attention away from the need to be doing something and allow you to focus on writing the material and then memorize it. Remember 15, 20 minutes, max 20, 15, 20 minutes, max, put your stuff down. Look, use a timer. If you've got to do this, Stop. I got some coffee. Stop, get up, walk around, go do something, do some push ups. Yeah, I know it's hard and I know it seems a little bit odd, but you wanted, you wanted efficiency, right? And you wanted effectiveness, as I'm hoping that's why you're even watching this, is you want it to be effective. Well, I'm telling you how it's effective. Get up, walk around clear your brain from the stuff you just looked at. Put it down. Everybody, put your pens down, put your markers down, get up, walk around, do something. I've got a spin bike outside. So when I'm working, I can't sit in front of a computer for very long, can't study for very long. I go up ooh, 30 seconds to a minute, blast it on a spin bike, get some water, I'm ready to go again. From a studying perspective, 15, maybe 20 minutes. Some of you can get away with 30 minutes, but I'm just telling you, you want it effective. Yes, that's how you do it. Now, again, as we get to the last part of this area, center of gravity, you see what I'm doing is I'm just taking it and I'm writing it down, center of gravity. And I'm trying to understand that concept, line of gravity, base of support, brings me into page 359. And I'm basically done with that. That's still chapter nine. Once again, we see it all the time. I've only got two weeks left. Um, I, I've only got a month or I'm taking my test in May or June or December, whatever the case is. 
I let it go too long and yada. And what that's going to do is that's going to cause stress and frustration when you try and study and cram as much information into that short period of time as possible. That's a disaster. And you know, it's a disaster. And the goal then is to back up, take a deep breath and use some of these basic elements of studying the techniques that I'm going over with you. And in particular, just and that's why I just did this one area for you. Now, I will continue next week to move through chapter nine into some of these other areas that I, and this is because folks have asked us. But if you do that, you should feel much more comfortable when you get to the practice exams, okay? If you've only got two weeks to study, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's, that's tough. If you've only got 30 days to study all of this material, then for sure, look in the uh, Body Design University, the study guide, the general study guide that we provide. It kind of helps you to navigate through the most important chapters, right? So there is a hierarchy of chapters that are going to be more representative on their exam than other chapters. Fact of the matter is, is that there are certain chapters in the ACE textbook where they're only going to pull one question, maybe two questions, right? Something like that. But I guarantee you, and if you look at many of the comments and responses that folks have put up for us, they'll tell you, you better know this, progressions, regressions, overactive, underactive, um, anatomy, whatever the case is. That's why you got to keep engaged in, uh, for instance, in our Facebook group, just as an example point is, is that there's a lot of material, but you have to put it in a hierarchy of importance, depending on how much time you have to study. So again, hope this was helpful. Uh, next week, we're going to kind of do the same thing. I'm going to repeat pretty much a lot of what I said today, uh, just so you can get it into your brain, this idea of read, write, recite, draw pictures, do whatever you have to do to creatively engage with the material. It's going to help you to memorize it and cover a different topic. Remember, um, our goal is to, again, help you pass the ACE exam on the first go around. Please subscribe to our channel. And if you uh, also click on that bell, you can get the uh, notifications when the new material is actually posted uh, for you. Have a great weekend. And remember, if you have any questions, put it in the comments and just let us know. Thanks. See you.